Go ahead and pray. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, maker of all things that are seen and unseen, to you only belong praise, glory, and honor, and the preeminence, because besides you there is no other God. You're the maker of heaven and earth, Lord, and in your name, Son's name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's what the Bible says. Now we have covered, <coughs> excuse me, we have covered nine plagues, and uh, I think we're going to be finishing off the ninth plague today, uh, the plague of darkness, and then we'll finish off with the death of the firstborn. And that's going to be the death of the flesh, not the soul, because the soul is eternal. It never dies. And that is, he is resurrection. Can you imagine if you leave, if Jesus is not in your life, you, all these plagues um, which the Lord used to attract us to him, um, they'll be not part of your life. So let's go ahead. Uh, uh, this is where we left off. Speak now the, in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and, of his, and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. Amen. Spoiler. So, yes, they're about to leave Egypt and, uh, and Moses is prepared. It's going to be. The Lord is telling Moses, this is what you're going to do. And in fact, he, he had already told them this. This is what's going to happen when you leave Egypt. Um, but notice now we'll, we'll switch it to, to the practical aspect, to us. What does it mean to us today? Speak now in the ears of the people. And uh, I, I had to deal with this passage. I said, so what is borrow? That word can mean demand. How can you demand of people? I mean... Uh, and look at this, this, uh, this other word, neighbors. Uh, neighbor can mean, uh, it means various things, but it can also mean mate. Uh, borrow of your mate. And I thought, I was thinking, well, if you're a, is, does this mean if you have a husband, you borrow of your wife, or if you're a wife, to borrow of your husband? Well, no, it doesn't really apply, because it says this, every man and every woman. Everybody's going to borrow. Everybody's going to demand. So look at this. These are Egyptians we're talking about. You're going to borrow. You're going to demand of the Egyptians before you leave. You're going to want these things before you leave. So let's look at this. Now, the mate, that would be the Egyptian. <coughs> borrow of your mate, the Egyptian. I thought, this doesn't make sense. But watch, it will make sense when you start looking at it. Because look, you have a body and you have a soul. The body is temporal and the soul is eternal. And you've heard the passage before, a soul mate. I've often heard that, but talking about a man and a woman being a soul mate. But really, that doesn't apply. This does. Your soul mate. Your soul made as your body, and I'll show you why. One is earthy, one is not earthy. And this is an Egyptian. Your body is an Egyptian because the body, you got your body in the world, and the world we know is Egypt. The world is a picture of Egypt. That means if your body is born in Egypt, it's Egyptian. Your body is Egyptian. And I'll show you why again. Look at this. When you look at the world of Israel, and this is the map I've been showing the kids, I want to teach them this so they know it left them backwards in every which way because this map, once you get to know this map, it, 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 you will understand a lot of things out of the Word of God because the Word of God is just, I, I'll never tire of saying it. It's amazing, folks, how the Word of God works. Now, look at that blue line. It divides the north and the south. That division was, has, was always there. It's always been there from the time they entered the land. When Joshua goes into the land, they conquered the south, and then they turn around and conquered the north. And, even, and, and then it's really divided after Solomon. 
the third king, Rehoboam, comes to the throne. And between Rehoboam rules the south and Jeroboam rules the north. So there's always a division. And the south will always have Simeon, which is a purple within Judah. That sort of dissolves. And we'll get come to that to another, at, at another time. And then that green part that's right next to Benjamin, that's Dan. And Dan disappears too. And that's very important. Uh, we'll have to deal with that at another time. But Dan, I mean, uh, the south consists of two parts, Benjamin and Judah. And that corresponds to the body. I mean, to the soul and the spirit. Now, what about the north? Well, the north, look at what's on the blue line. Ephraim and Manasseh. And you know what those boys are? Egyptians. They're, they were born in, they're the sons of Joseph, but they were born in Egypt. So they're Egyptians. So this is why I tell you, your body is Egyptian. It's of the world. And the, it can never please God. So, okay, now watch this. Jewels, borrowed jewels of silver and jewels of gold. Now look at the word jewel and it means something prepared. Jewels of silver and silver is a, a metal of, it represents salvation because that's what the Lord was sold, you know. It was, he was sold by a redemption. It was, he was sold by what silver, uh, pieces of silver and gold represents good works because anything that's not good works is going to be burnt away but good works is solid gold so borrow jewels of silver and jewels of gold a who of your mate your mate is capable of producing these things ah very interesting your body the, if you use it correctly you, when you leave this world you're going to leave with jewels you know Watch this. The Bible tells us so. <clears throat> I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. Now, this is, we were told this early on. This is way back in Exodus 3.21. This is a long time ago. God says, this is what's going to happen. You can do this. You can use your body to profit from, you know, whatever length of time you have in this world, you can use it for benefit. I mean, Many people are going to go to heaven and they're going to get, get there by the skin of their teeth with nothing to show for. And the guy says, well, I gave you 65 years, you know, what do you have to show for? it?" Well, I have this big mansion and all these boats and cars and things. He says, well, it's all wood, hay and stubble. You know, you got no gold with you. Now look at this also. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you. See, there's that silver part. There's that silver part. Work out your salvation. And then in Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There's the gold, which God has before ordained that we should walk in him. And look at that word, prepared, prepared a for. That's, that's, that's what the jewels are. Isn't it amazing how God has, and I always think of kids during Easter, how <clears throat> the eggs, you have an Easter hunt, and the, the eggs are really easy. I mean, there they are, bright red, bright yellow, and bright blue sticking out, and the kids are going all over the grass looking for them, and you can see them a mile away, you know? And yet they're having a great time hunting down the eggs. But that's what the Lord does for us as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The works that we do is like he makes them so, it makes it so easy. I mean, there it is. All you got to do is go pick them up. And these are works that have been already put there for us to pick up. And no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, sweeping a floor uh, cutting grass, uh, teaching a class, uh, you know, leading uh, kids uh, uh, at a retreat or something. Whatever it is, these are works that God has put in there and you're going to get rewarded for it, you know.
if, you're done, if they're done in the right attitude. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great <clears throat> in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So that, there it is again, God gave favor. We get favor. And Moses was very great in the sight of Pharaoh's servants. And I think that, now when we're looking at it from the uh, point of view that Pharaoh is the will, because that's what God's been working against. Through all, the, through all these plagues, God's been going after Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is the king. And the king in, your, in you, the king in you is the will. That's the ultimate, the buck stops here. You decide. It's your decision. Uh, and you can really see it in the book of Esther. The book of Esther, it jumps out so big. The king, everybody bows to the king. And in, in our lives, the will, it's stubborn. Our will is stubborn, and yet it, it is the king. And so Pharaoh is the king. And the servants of the king are the emotions and the intellect and the cattle. And we looked at the cattle. Okay, um, Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, it's all by grace, in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Everything, include his salvation, and then he working through us, it's all his doing. Um, I, I work with kids, you know, teaching them to draw. And oftentimes, I, I've, got, I've gotten kids that they have a hard time um, with, with a, a, a manipulating a pencil. And sometimes it can be frustrating because if I tell them to draw a box, they have a hard time drawing it. And I tell them, look, look, it's very easy. Just let go of your hand. Let go. Make it very limp. And then I, I put my hand over theirs, and I say, see? See, like this. But if they don't let the hand go, it's very stiff and I, it's difficult, you know? And that's how the Lord, the Lord, that says grace, how he does all these things for us. It's all favor, by his favor. Um, and then Moses, of course, we looked at how Moses, anytime Moses speaks, he speaks the word of God. So when Moses speaks, God speaks. It's the same thing, the law of God. And Moses said, thus says the Lord, so now we finally, we finish off the, the, the ninth plague, and now we start off with the, the last one. Res, he is resurrection, the death of the firstborn. Now look what happens here. And Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. But the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the mate, servant that is behind the mill and all the firstborn of beasts. Notice how many times firstborn is mentioned here. Moses said that's the law. So what the law says, you can take it to the bank. It's, it, it's unchanging. You can't change that. That's the law. Firstborn, firstborn, firstborn. So God wants us to concentrate on that. Now what is the firstborn? You're born first when you're born in, in this world, you're born with a body and soul. And of course, our spirit is not, not functioning. And so when we're saved, see, this is the first birth. And we're born in Egypt. And so when you become a Christian, now the spirit of God comes inside you. This is to be born again of the spirit. And the minute you're born of the spirit, you're, you're circumcised from the flesh, so you're no longer attached to the flesh. You're now attached to the spirit. And at death, you're going to heaven. Because the spirit can never go to hell. It's impossible for the spirit of God to go to hell. The spirit of God can always return back to the father of spirits. And that's heaven. And when it returns, he has said in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you. That means he'll take you with him. So that's, 
But now he, it shall die. The firstborn shall die. That's what it says. The firstborn shall die. Everybody. That's and the soul. Now, but here now we're talking about a Christian there with the spirit. Now with Israel, they didn't have the spirit. So Israel has a problem here because they don't have the spirit. But God makes provision for them. He says, he says, here's what's going to happen. You're going to die, but instead of you dying, somebody else will die for you instead. That's the provision he made. And so the provision is that he, you're going to take a little lamb. You're going to take an animal. And because the law, the law applies to every single person. There's no exceptions. Whether you're Hebrew or you're Egyptian, you know, just like when he came and killed the Egyptian and then he, the, the, the next day the Hebrews were fighting among themselves and they said, are you going to do the same thing to us as you did to the Egyptian? The answer is yes, because the law doesn't change. The law is, is the law. You can't make exceptions. So in this case, the law will kill you, except somebody already died. So you're good, you know. Oh, it's amazing what God has done. When you go through the Bible, everywhere in the Bible you find Jesus. Amen. Jesus is all over the Bible. You know, it's amazing. Um, blood of the Lamb. That's what that is. It's going to take care of you. So and this is about to happen. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it, any anymore, but against any of the children of the Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between Egyptians and Israel. So, and I'm thinking, can you imagine? Because at the end of the world, or at the end of time, when God judges everybody, when He this is going to be dreadful. I mean, for us that are Christians already, you know, we're just going to live at the end of, to the end of our lives. We do what work we have to do, and then we'll go home. I mean, that's the way it is, you know. But people that are not going home, the Bible says there's going to be a great cry. Because, I mean, all, I can only imagine all the times this was offered to them, and they rejected it. Just like Pharaoh. He rejected it. He kept on rejecting it. When he said, you shall see my face no more, and Moses says, you're right. I shall see your face no more. It's a dreadful thing. Um, that you may know that the Lord does put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So there is a difference. You know, everybody dies. Die, the Egyptian dies, and the Hebrew dies. Both of them. It, there's no difference. Because all have sinned, except in the Israel case, he's already covered. He's already been covered. And God, throughout the Bible, the blood is so important, folks. I mean, you know, we preach at this church, we preach the God blood, big time. We preach the blood. And uh, <laughs> as I was going through this portion, and wait till we get to Leviticus. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen the blood yet until you go through Leviticus. Oh, good. I can hardly wait. I wish we were skipping Matthew <laughs> so we could get into Leviticus. Because we're going to go to Matthew, and then we're going to come back to Leviticus. And Leviticus, what a lot of people consider, you know, fluff or just, I wish, who wrote this thing? Folks, there's so many secrets in there. God, I mean, he talks about the, the psychic the brain, the, the mind. I mean, that's very. If you thought going through the plagues, it shows you what the mind is like. Wait till you get to Leviticus. It really gets into it because now you get you're on the other side. But God is a, and he's all that to tell you that God is. He needs to see the blood. It's very important, and he says, "I need to see it. I need to see the blood because to him." God is a holy God, and for us to walk into heaven, our sins must have been paid for. And he looks, you know, like you go through a security at the airport. You know, they go through your stuff. 
God says, where's the blood? You got any blood with you? Yes, sir, here it is. Good, pass on. You know, the blood is so important. And we're talking about the blood of Jesus. And so the Hebrews are covered, or Christians are covered, but those without the blood, that's the right word for it. They're lost. They're lost because they cannot proceed on to heaven. And the body dies, but they will be given. I was talking to a person yesterday. I says, everybody's going to get a new body. Everybody's going to get a new body. He says, really? He says, yeah, everybody. One to withstand the pressures of heaven, which is fantastic, and one to withstand the heat of hell, wherein nobody dies. I says, everybody's going to get a new body. And all these thy servants shall come down and unto me, uh, unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. And I thought, this is amazing. This is what, what it must be like for God. You know, you, God, through Moses, speaking through Aaron, to the will of He's saying, because Moses can't speak to us. We, can, we, we can't hear him. He, he's got to have a mediator, and the mediator is Jesus. That's Aaron. So what God says, he gives it to Moses, and Moses says to Aaron, tell him this. And, and, and he's neglected, I mean, he's rejected it. So thus far, he walks out in great anger. It says Moses went out great, in great anger because he's rejected what's been offered to him. And I'm thinking, this is what, it must, what God must feel like when people reject the great offer, the great grace that he's been offering people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. So, of course, it says here, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, but that means that the laws of God, once you don't obey God, the next time is going to be easier. And the third time, even easier. And fourth, even easier, to the point that it just becomes so easy that it's just natural to harden yourself. Sure. It'll just be natural. And how many people I think of uh, that have that continue to do the same thing over? I think of people that, that steal. I mean, if I, oh, yesterday I went uh, to eat at a place and they gave me, they gave me, I think that it, the meal was $8 and some cents, I forget what it was. But he gave me, I saw when he gave me the change, it was a $10 bill, $2.82. And I was walking out, I says, he gave you a dollar extra. I says, yeah, he did, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. And so I was walking to the, my truck and I says, he gave you a dollar extra. I says, yes, it's what, it's just a dollar. Ah, I, go, I go back and he says, hey man, you gave me a deck, an extra dollar since I did. I says, yeah, here. And then I felt great. I mean, I walked out and says, okay, a dollar is nothing. I'd rather feel good. Because I know at midnight it would say, you know, that was a dollar. You know, that's how the mind works and, and, and the conscience is. And so this is what happens. You harden yourself against God, and you're not going to be tender like that, where the Lord can just speak to, speak to you at any, at anything, and, and you listen. So it's a natural thing. Pharaoh is the will, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And, and of course, I keep bringing this verse up. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is true, folks. Many people say, That's, that can't be true. That must be true of really, I mean, serial killers and all that. No, it's true of me. I mean, my heart. 
It, it just defies just about anything I want to do. It, it just, you know, you can do this. It's okay. Now, okay, so now we get into 12. We're into chapter 12. Now, look what happens here. Um, it's amazing because we're talking about the firstborn death. And, and the Lord spake unto Moses and, and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And this is, this is it, folks. This, this month here, Nisan Abib, this one here. This is the first three feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. They all happen right next to each other. We're going to cover a, a couple of them if we have the time. Um, and then in the summertime, you have the Feast of Weeks, which is around May, June, corresponds to our May, June time. And then in the fall, which is September, October, you have the trumpets at the beginning uh, of Tishri, and then you have atonement and tabernacle. These are the seven feasts that God gave them. Now, these, little, these details, when you read in the Bible, they're mentioned, and we just pass them right, right, you know, right quick. But they're very important because they give you, it's, it's a clock. History, like a couple of times I got, I've gone to Israel, I love it because I'm looking at the land like, oh, yeah, this is where that happened. This is where this happened. This is where that happened. And I'm looking at because it, the Bible's a real book. I mean, it's a real history that took place in a real place in real time. So the more you want to know about the Bible, you got to pay attention to all the details because later on they're going to come back and you're going to get insights. Okay? So here you have... Uh, the first, and then all the other months follow that. That's the first one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're never named. They're just numbered, you know, like, like we, num we named our months as well as they did, but the Lord always uh, just gives them a number. And so, now when we get into the month Nisan, this is when it happens. It says, speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So they're going to have to take a lamb. Everybody's going to take one. And if the household be too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your own count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats. So this is, this is the requirements on the 10th day of the month. And then, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole con assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper post, door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Now here's some interesting, because look, you take the lamb from the flock on the 10th day, and then on the 14th day, four days later, that's when you're going to kill it. Now, is, does this mean that you take the lamb into your house to, as a pet? Is this supposed, you know, folks, I don't have animals because I'll get attached to them. I mean, I'll get attached to lizards. <laughs> it happened before. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I found myself talking to them. I says, guys, you know, I know you're hungry, but I'm watching the Dallas Cowboys. I'm not going to go looking for fro <laughs> little flies for you. And then one day I was looking for little, little they love little green uh, hoppers, grasshoppers. And I was out there in a field, we out there by 1604 in a field collecting them. <laughs> and I had the door to my vehicle open so I could listen to the game. I said, something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, go, this is not going to work. They did, I go get their own food. And so... The reason I had them, I had them because I was studying their limbs, you know. I was studying how they wrinkle and how they bend them. And so I went home and I let them go. So I says, I know I'll get attached to it. I don't have cats. I don't have dogs. I'm not a cat person. I love dogs. But I know if I have a dog pretty soon, 
I'll, I'll be attached, I know. And I think this is what would happen here. If you bring a lamb into the house, especially if you have little kids, little boys, little girls, they're going to get attached to Fluffy, you know? They're going to get attached to it. And then they would say, Dad, what are you doing? We're going to have to kill it. What? You can't do that. And you know what this brings to mind, folks? What if, what if the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these people, what if they had seen the truth and re recognized the Lord as the Savior, the Lamb of God, who takes, which takes away the sins of the world? This is he. And we're going to have to kill him? The whole assembly of Israel would have gathered together with tears in their eyes. They would have, we're going to have to kill Jesus. But he's a good man. But the Bible, the Lord says, you're going to have to kill him. This is not right. You're going to have to kill him. Can you imagine the kinds of people that would have killed him? Uh, the high <coughs> priest would have done it, but he would have done it with tears in his eyes, with tender hands. It would have been very different. Uh, and I think this is what it shows us. If they would have gone that route, but they didn't. The people that killed them were evil. They were evil, and they, they, they beat him up really bad. But I think this is what this shows us, this teaches us. The whole congregation shall kill it in the evening. And they shall put the blood on the, on the two sides and on the, on the top lintel of the door. That's where the blood goes. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it, eat not of it raw, nor sotten at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with all his partenance thereof. So this is, this, God gave him exactly the rules, what you're going to do with it. You cannot eat, it's got to be roasted. Twice we'll mention that, it's, it's mentioned that. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire, and thus shall it, you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So this is where that word Passover comes from. This is the Lord's Passover at that night when the angel of death is going to come into Egypt. This is where we get the Passover. And for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Moses and, and the Lord are speaking. And the blood shall be unto you for a token upon the houses wherein you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. There it is again, folks. He sees, he points this out. I need to see the blood. It's got to be on your house. It's got to be applied. This, this theme reoccurs over and over and over that the blood is very important. When I smite the land of Egypt, and that's the world. And the world, there's a day coming for the world. There's an appointment. And all this time, especially we that live in the time of grace, all this time, I mean, this is the easiest time in the history of the world to get saved. All you got to do is believe it, and it's applied to you. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. So this is what the Lord wants to be remembered, and of course this is why we celebrate, or the Jewish people celebrate it. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, even the first day shall you put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day, even until 
the seventh day that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now notice what happens here. You have the Passover and immediately you go into seven days. The first day shall be, so you put away leaven, that's sin. And, that's, and this is a picture of what the Lord expects from us. Once the blood has been applied to our lives, once we take the blood, you're not the same anymore. You are now born again. And so the Lord expects something. Look what it says. Cease to put away leaven. And leaven is a picture of sin. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So what he's telling us is, once the blood has been applied to your house, once you, the angel of death passes over, God expects something from you. Sanctification. He now expects you to be set apart. He now expects sin to be put away. He now expects the leaven to not be there anymore. He says, and that seven, he says seven days, but that seven could mean indefinitely. It could be a, a big number. It's, it's forever. Let's go a few more slides. And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that that only may be done for you. You shall not work on the first day, nor on the seventh day. And convocation means a calling. So we're called unto that. That's our calling. God calls us unto sanctification. That's what no manner of work shall be done in there. So he says this, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So this is his will. This is what he wants. Once you're, once you're covered by the blood, you're sanctified, prepared unto every good work, and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for the, in this selfsame day came, have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month and on the 14th day of the month, at even you shall eat unleavened bread until the day of one and 20th day of the, of the month at even. So God expects to live like that. Because the bread is it's, it's, it's for living. So God says, this is, you're going to eat unleavened bread. This is what I want from you. And this is called the... So right next to each other, the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened, and, and we won't cover the Feast of the First Fruits because that's for later on. But you can see on the 14th day and on the first day of the following week, those are Sabbath, two Sabbaths right next to each other. Although it falls on a Monday... Uh, on a Sunday, a Saturday and a Sunday, these are Sabbath, Sabbath. And now we, when we looked at Mark, we saw three Sabbath right next to each other. You know, th there were high days. So here you have, this is, this is what can, so you, uh, when you read the Bible, sometimes it gets confusing as to what day, what Sabbath, what Sabbath it is. But that's because, these people, you got to go back and look at things like this or Leviticus 23 where you have all the feasts mentioned, how they run together. And on the 14th day of the first of the, of the month, even at even such shall you eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. Eve, seven days shall, ye, shall there be no leavened bread found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether it be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Notice how, how much he repeats it over and over and over. He keeps repeating this. I guess we better stop there. Uh, this is a good place to stop. Um, and um, so let us go ahead and pray Lord God thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us Lord thank you for being so good to us thank you for your mercy and kindness 
And thank you again for your wondrous word and the insight you give us into it. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray, for beside you there is another God. Amen. 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 <laughs>